Order, end of clarification, ministerial statement, the Minister for Transport. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> Several members have filed parliamentary questions on the Certificate of Entitlement, and my ministerial statement will address questions 1 to 7 for oral answer, as well as question 25 for written answer in today's order paper, as well as related questions that have been filed for subsequent sittings. So I will preface my reply to members' questions with an overview of our land transport system. To be complete, any discussion on COEs must be situated within the broader context of our land transport system, of which private cars are but one aspect. So to meet the transport needs of Singaporeans and enhance our living environment, we must address two key constraints, land, and carbon emissions. <clears throat> Roads occupy 12% of our land, compared to around 13% for industry and 15% for housing. Our land transport system accounts for about 15% of Singapore's total domestic carbon emissions. We must make it much more sustainable as part of the national effort to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Pre-COVID, about 14 million journeys were made every day across four modes, public transport, point-to-point -point transport, private vehicles, and active mobility. So that is the scale of the challenge. The government's aim is to build an accessible, inclusive, and sustainable land transport system that meets the needs of all Singaporeans. The best way to achieve this is through mass public transport. It allows the greatest number of people to get to their destinations with the least land take and carbon emissions. Our rail network serves around 3 million journeys a day, and it takes up less than 1% of our total surface area. In contrast, Roads take up 12% of our land for 7 million journeys. This includes those made by cars, motorcycles, buses, as well as PHCs. Compared to driving an internal combustion engine car, taking the train reduces our carbon footprint by 90%. That is why public transport, mass public transport, is the core of our transport strategy, and our rail network is the backbone of our transport system. Today, seven in 10 households are within a 10-minute walk of one of our 202 MRT and LRT stations. By the next decade, it will be eight in 10 households. To achieve this, we are building an additional 100 kilometers of rail almost a 40% increase from our current rail network. By 2035, we will have eight MRT lines and two LRT lines interconnected and reaching all parts of the island. As we expand our public transport network, we are also ensuring that it is inclusive, affordable, and sustainable. Today, all our MRT stations and bus interchanges, as well as 98% of our bus stops are barrier free, and the work is ongoing. Public transport, as we have discussed many times in this house, is heavily subsidized. And our public transport fleet will fully comprise cleaner energy models by 2040. We are also improving first mile, last mile connectivity with extensive infrastructure for cyclists and pedestrians. By 2030, the island-wide cycling path network will more than double to about 1,300 kilometers. 
Through LTA's Friendly Streets initiative, we will work with the local communities to create more pedestrian-friendly facilities within residential neighborhoods. <clears throat> more broadly, LTA and fellow government agencies are integrating land transport and urban planning strategies to enhance the livability of our city by bringing jobs closer to homes, developing lifestyle and amenity hubs near transport nodes, and making public transport and active mobility convenient for the daily commute. Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, given the land and carbon constraints I have highlighted, going car light is a key strategy that our agencies have adopted. With excellent public transport connectivity and active mobility infrastructure, less road and parking spaces are needed for general vehicular traffic. This is the car light future that we envisage as we plan and redevelop our precincts to prioritize pedestrians, cyclists, and public transport users and lessen the need for and use of private cars. Even amongst cars, there is a spectrum of choices. Shared transport, which includes both taxis and private hire cars, or PHCs, providing point-to-point -point passenger transport services, complements mass public transport. They provide a useful alternative to car ownership for those who may need access to car-like services, whether chauffeured or self-driving. Today, the P2P sector accounts for 1 million daily journeys, up from 800,000 in 2012. With zero growth in our car population, such shared transport, including car sharing services, allow for a more efficient, an inclusive use of our roads, serving the needs of many more Singaporeans as compared to individually owned private cars. The total PHC population has averaged around 70,000 since 2019, with some fluctuations due to COVID-19 and the subsequent reopening of Singapore's economy. As a proportion of the total car population, PHCs have remained at around 10 percent the past four years. In fact, the period when we saw the fastest growth in PHC numbers was between 2015 to 2017, when it increased from 30,000 to almost 70,000. There was no commensurate upward pressure on COE prices in that period. Conversely, while COE prices have been rising over the past several quarters, demand from PHC companies has, in fact, been moderating. PHCs are a flexible way to augment the supply of point-to-point -point passenger transport, giving commuters more choices while serving a much wider segment of society than private cars. So we should be careful when making calls about imposing caps, sometimes arbitrary, on the PHC population. That said, the PHCs are a relatively new development. The P2P regulatory framework, for example, only commenced in 2017. And COVID-19 has also caused some disruption in the market. So we are studying this further to ascertain the effect of PHCs and whether if there is, in fact, any impact on the market. On private car ownership, there are encouraging trends, especially among our youth. According to a Straits Times survey, the percentage of youth who aspire to own a car has fallen from around 65% in 2016 to around 50% in 2022. More than 75% of the respondents cited ready access to public transport as the reason why they did not aspire to own a car. Nevertheless, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, we do recognize 
that there is still a desire to own a car. For some, it is a necessity. For others, a useful option. Yet others, an aspiration. Hence, it's quite understandable that members have raised questions on the COEs and prices. COEs are a key feature of our vehicle quota system. The VQS is essential for us to achieve our zero growth rate policy objective for cars and motorcycles. It is the principal tool to manage ownership as recognized in the 1996 White Paper on creating a world-class land transport system. The vehicle quota system fundamentally works through supply and demand forces to efficiently allocate a scarce resource, COEs. The system also incorporates progressivity considerations by having different COE categories. In fact, when the COE system first started in 1990, there were four categories for cars. The number of categories was reduced to the current two in 1999 to address concerns over the relatively small quota supply and resultant volatility, as well as limited choices of cars in some categories. Category E, which is the open category, was retained to allow for changing preferences and needs in vehicle types over time. Mr. Liang Yinghua has asked if there are plans to review the COE system. On the whole, the system continues to serve our policy objective of efficiently allocating the limited supply of COEs. However, over the years, the Ministry of Transport and the Land Transport Authority have made various refinements to the VQS system to ensure its relevance and efficacy without forsaking the core policy intent. The power rating criterion of 97 kilowatts was introduced in 2014 for the mass market Cat A so that car COE categories are differentiated not just by engine capacity. Last year, as more electric car models became available in Singapore, we increased the power output threshold for Cat A COEs to 110 kilowatt hour in order to accommodate mass market electric cars. On Mr. Liang, Liang Man Wai's question, between 2018 and April this year, the median open market value or OMV for Cat A cars for each year was just over half of the median OMV for Cat B cars in the same year. So in other words, if I can put it the other way, Cat B OMVs in the median is about 75% higher compared to the median in Cat A. So there is a clear differentiation although it may not be a complete dichotomization of the market. And we will continue to monitor and review the differentiating criteria between categories A and B as the technology evolves. <clears throat> Ms. Mariam Jaffa and Mr. Saktiandi Supat asked about CAT DCOEs for motorcycles. A key feature of the motorcycle market is that dealers bid and hold the Temporary Certificates of Entitlement, or TCOEs, in their own name before transferring it to a motorcycle buyer. This is a deliberate design feature because it provides convenience for buyers who can readily purchase a motorcycle. This is unlike the car market where bids are primarily in the name of the buyer. The prospective car buyers who need immediate access to a car, in other words, a bid was not submitted in their name, can rely on CAT E COEs, where there's some flexibility. As I explained at my ministry's committee of supply debate this year, 
about 450 Cat D temporary COEs that were secured when prices were close to or above $13,000 were subsequently left to expire when COE prices fell. To Ms. Mariam Jaffa's query, the expired TCOEs were held by more than 50 dealers. And of course, those with a bigger market share contributed more. But there is a spread. The TCOE utilization rate subsequently went back up with the market correcting when it could not support the prevailing prices. And this is what we mean by the market working as intended. In other words, it responds to price signals upwards or downwards, and then there is a reallocation. Nevertheless, to improve allocative efficiency and deter any speculative bidding, we made further moves recently to increase the bid deposit from $800 to $1,500 and to shorten the TCOE validity period from three months to one month. Let me now address some of the specific questions raised by various members about car COE prices. Dr. Lim Wee Kiak and Ms. Joan Pereira asked about the impact of foreigners. And I know this is a common query. The proportion of car COEs secured by foreigners remains low, and it has not changed significantly over the years. As I shared in January this year, from July 2020 to December 2022, on average, less than 3% of car COEs were allocated to foreigners. And this number has remained stable. Another common query, there's no specific PQ on this, but I know it's on many members' minds and elsewhere. Another common query is about multiple car owning households. In November last year, I had shared with this House that as of 31st October 2022, of the 471,000 households that own cars, and that's about 36% of all households in Singapore, so of that 471,000 households, 12% own two cars and less than 3% own three or more cars. And the percentage just remain about the same today. And in fact, over the past decade, the proportion of multiple car owning households has been steadily declining from about 19% of households in 2012 to less than 15% today. I had also, in a response to a PQ, I think, earlier in the year by Mr. Gerald Giam, pointed out, and it is worth noting and underscoring, that these multiple car-owning households reside not just in private residential estates, but also in public housing, including some households that own three or more cars. Mr. Saktiandi Supar asked about the effect of car shows and promotions. As the member would be well aware, consumers make their purchasing decisions based on a myriad of factors. So it is actually quite difficult to establish a causal relationship between such car shows and promotions with COE prices. So what then is the cause of rising COE prices? Fundamentally, the COE prices reflect demand for a limited supply of COEs. And this is further accentuated or exacerbated by the fact that we are now at a trough in the 10-year cycle of COE supply. Demand in all categories has remained resilient, especially as the economy recovers from post-COVID-19. And incomes have also been rising over the long term. As was observed in Professor Raymond Ong's article in the Straits Times on the 7th of May, the ratio of COE prices to median monthly household income has fallen 
from 11 to 1 during the previous COE price peak in 2013 to 9 is to 1 today. So in comparison to median income, the COE price is actually lower. Although in absolute terms, the price has risen. And the reason is because household incomes have risen. As household incomes continue to rise in the coming years, coupled with our policy of zero growth in car population, we must expect the long-term trajectory for COE prices to be upwards. COE supply, in turn, is determined primarily by car deregistrations in preceding quarters, which has been relatively low of late. Over the past few months, the Ministry of Transport has made several moves to reduce volatility in quota supply. Instead of just the preceding quarter, we first adopted the average of the preceding two quarters in August last year, and now use the moving average of deregistrations in the four preceding quarters to compute COE quotas for the next quarter. These moves have helped to mitigate quarter-on-quarter -quarter volatility. We also expect the COE supply to start increasing substantially in the coming months as more cars reach the 10-year mark. Notwithstanding this, MOT and LTA have studied if there's more that we can do to smoothen the supply of COEs in categories A and B, while adhering, importantly, to the cap on the overall car population over the 10-year cycle. Consequently, as a one-off exercise, LTA will bring forward and redistribute the supply from five-year COEs, which are due to expire, in the next projected supply peak. As these five-year COEs cannot be extended and therefore have to be deregistered, LTA will be able to identify the exact number with certainty. This supply will be redistributed over several quarters starting from the next bidding exercise. This move will increase quota supply in the next bidding exercise by about 24% in CAT A and 15% in CAT B. LTA will release more details shortly. Even as we make this move, I would like to emphasize two points. First, this will help to lessen, but it will not eliminate volatility in supply. There will still be a degree of supply fluctuation due to historical factors and also broader market conditions. Secondly, the long-term upward trend of COE prices due to rising incomes and zero vehicle population growth will not abate. So, Deputy Speaker, sir, as we seek to improve the efficiency of the COE system with these measures that have been already undertaken over the years, it is important that we do not lose sight of our goal of becoming a car light society with accessible and inclusive transport for all Singaporeans. The COE system helps us to make our transport system more sustainable and our living environment better for all. As Singapore develops and grows, Singaporeans' transport needs will continue to evolve, and our transport policies must move in tandem while paying heed to our key constraints. The government is committed to developing the necessary policies and infrastructure to build a car light, accessible, inclusive, and sustainable transport system to meet the diverse needs of Singaporeans. It is part of our social compact, anchored by the values we hold as a society. Ultimately, our success in realizing that vision rests in the commuting choices that every Singaporean makes every day. Thank you, Deputy Speaker.